This is Defenders TV podcast episode 176 about I'm Fist season 2, episode 2, The City's Not for Burning. Welcome back, fellow Defenders, to episode 176 of Defenders TV Podcast, where we are looking at the second episode in I'm Fist Season 2, The City's Not for Burning, or, as Margaret Thatcher once said, This Lady is Not for Turning. (laughs) But that's a dreadful joke, as far as I'm concerned, but I thought I should say it. Um, Well, I did try and set you up for that at the end of our last episode, and you missed it completely. It went straight over your head. (laughs) But not now. No. no but are. I am your really bad comedian host, John. I'm your equally bad comedian host, Derek. And rounding out the group, I am the second most good looking Jones <laughs> that we will be talking about in this podcast. Obviously, there's Finn Jones. And then somewhere below there, there's me. I'm not sure if the magnitude of gap between it. But somewhere in there, it's like Finn Jones, Chris Jones. We'll try not to talk about Jessica this time then, Chris. Oh, God damn it! I'm the third most attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, man. No problem. No <laughs> problem. threw me down another peg. <laughs> yes. Welcome back, fellow defenders. This is our spoiler-filled review of Iron Fist Season 2, Episode 2, The City's Not for Burning. Uh, and you can, of course, listen to all our episodes of this season of Iron Fist over at our website. You can get access on Defenders tvpodcast.com you can subscribe leave a review and rate us over on any good podcast catcher of choice uh, whichever you prefer apple podcasts google podcasts podcast addict stitcher you name it just head on over to our website and you can subscribe through one of the links on our home page mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Welcome back to this episode, yeah. Hope you're enjoying your binge of of Iron Fist and hope us having these episodes out in the same day is helping you have a little break to have a little listen to us while you're going around doing your shopping to finish your binge of Iron Fist. No, more importantly, they're listening to this as they play Spider-Man on the PS4. That's right, that's right. The second biggest release on Friday, the 7th of September. We need to get sponsorship from PlayStation for these adverts for for Spider-Man, don't we? I really should. Is it <laughs> September 7th yet? <laughs> well, it is for our for our fellow defenders, but not for us right now. Again, we are recording in advance of the episodes coming out, so we will not have any feedback within this episode. We're hoping that you're going to send us in your feedback and your thoughts about the episodes as they go on, and we'll drop them into our episode reviews of Iron Fist. Uh, the way you do that is by going to our website at DefendersTVPodcast.com, where you can record a voicemail to us of up to 90 seconds of your thoughts about any of the episodes, or you can email us at feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com. Or, of course, you can head over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash defenderstvpodcast, and we'll have spoiler posts up there for all of the episodes that we'll be discussing. Yes, we want to hear your thoughts about this episode. We want to hear your thoughts on Spider-Man PS4. But more importantly, give me your top five most attractive Joneses in ranking order. <laughs> uh, we can start a nice poll, be it on Facebook, or you can even leave us a voicemail just listing it out. Yes, I am interested. Who are your Joneses? Which Joneses are you keeping up with? Jones is a rather common name, Chris. No offense, like, but there might be more than five on that list. I know, but at least we, we got to start somewhere. <laughs> I can't say the top 100 Joneses would be here for a while. <laughs> and of course, maybe if you're in Wales, you know plenty of Joneses. <laughs> Chris, uh, I presume your ancestry goes back to the the Welsh mountains. It probably does, but right now I'm just hoping it was coming from Cunglone. Because we saw some amazing Cuglin scenes in this episode. Yes, we did. We certainly did. And with that, Derek, who wrote and directed this episode? This episode was written by John Worley, first time working over the Marvel Universe shows, but was a writer and producer on the American remake of Mad Dogs, an excellent show. I really, really enjoyed that. Interestingly, he started out his working life as a staff writer on Terriers, which starred our favourite member of the Gotham cast, Donald Logue. Yes, Harvey Bullock. 
get in the mm-hmm. yeah and the terriers is a great show go ahead and check that one out uh watch that over the over the last couple of years while watching donald do his harvey bullock shtick on the uh, on gotham good to see a different side of his acting as well uh the episode was directed by rachel talele a very well-known british director who did episodes of doctor who some fantastic episodes of doctor who actually um some of the best in the last couple of seasons she worked with Davos himself, Sasha Dewan, on her episode of Sherlock as well. So she has that connection with Sasha. And I know they became very good friends on the set of uh, of Sherlock. So they're very much in contact with each other. And she does some great work with them in this episode. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So a Whovian to a Sherlockian to a Fistian. Yes, exactly. Interesting. Something like that. Something like that. But... And even more interesting for me, because I'm a huge comic fan, I'm a huge horror fan too. Uh, she started out a career as the director of Freddy's Dead, the final official <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street film, and also directed Tank Girl starring Laurie Petty. Wow. Who also featured in Gotham, our other podcast, just to give a little plug for Gotham TV podcast while we're on our break. Uh, but yes, yeah, she uh, she did work with Laurie Petty back in her huge role in Tank Girl. Fantastic. Fantastic. Se- some would say seminal role. I would say a huge role. Yeah. A huge role for Massive. Me, definitely. Uh, got to check out that Gotham episode, Chris. I've been plugging it for a while now. Got to check out, you check have. out on, that, on that episode. And finally, as we always discuss on these episodes, the episode titled The City's Not For Turning is from another issue of Iron Fist this time. It's from the third issue of Iron Fist solo series from the year I was born in February 1976. The issue was written by Chris Claremont with art by John Byrne and featured an adventure with Danny teaming up with Misty Knight on a visit to London. Wow, governor. Up oh, the apples and pears. Well, it's kind of interesting having Rachel Tolley direct the episode and it fe- and the original issue featuring a visit to London from Danny Rand. That's quite cool. Absolutely. Wow. And 1976. That's such a long time ago. Hey, that's my age. <laughs> but we do know Misty Knight obviously is going to be featured in the show this season. Not in this episode. I had speculated before the show was coming out that this might be the start of Misty's run on the show, but she hasn't appeared just yet. So we will be seeing her later on in the season. But John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for this episode of Iron Fist? Sure. As tensions escalate between the gangs, the Golden Tigers and the Hatchets, a violent exchange spills onto the streets of Chinatown. Danny pays a visit to Mr. Yang, the head of the Hatchet Gang, to persuade him to broker a deal with the rival Triad Gang. But when he refuses, the deal is secured by Colin Wing with his wife, as Colin continues to investigate her childhood come on that was left at the community centre. But with the fighting on the streets, Danny's mind turns to his memories of Kunlun and his fight with Davos to gain the right to challenge Shao Lao the Immortal. However, Davos and Joy's minds focus on finalising their scheme against Danny Rand and Ward Meacham. When Mr. Yang changes the terms of their deal again, Davos moves against him, deploying an ancient Kunlun technique to his neck, whilst Joy arranges the purchase of a rare artefact at auction that is essential to the success of their plan. Another chance meeting between Danny and Mary throws up some awkward moments after she is invited to the dojo and meets Colleen. Whilst Colleen and Danny shrug off Mary's behaviour, an unsettling obsession with Danny Rand looks to be smouldering under the surface of this seemingly quiet artist from Wisconsin. We had some unsettling scenes, we had some difficult scenes, some uncomfortable scenes, and some fantastic fight scenes. But let's get into our top five points. Chris, do you want to take point number one, murder in Canal's Street? Kind of looking at this is where Danny's on the trail of the triads, where we start seeing him going beyond the the boardroom Danny, which we saw glimpses of in season one, Mm -hmm. going beyond the, the vagrant kind of Buddhist monk Danny who's just wandering the city at one point in season one. <laughs> he's wearing shoes this season. Well done. Exactly. Exactly. He's in some good cons by the looks of things. No, I, I enjoyed this seeing him kind of taking the fight, or in this case, the peace talks, mm-hmm. to the enemy. Yeah, yeah. Like the two of the, himself and Colleen kind of figuring, okay, well, the only way to stop the impending war will be actually to force um a will be to force a a parlay between the two groups Mm -hmm. and they're they're willing they're they're not backing down they're they're saying okay we're if we have to we will do other things and there's that scene where colleen and danny are saying i hope this works and she's like if it doesn't we will we'll work on it another way so they're still willing to have the battle but what we see here is the mature danny 
the or the maturing Danny who's willing to respect, say, Colleen's attempt to put down the sword. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So getting him to be more what we would expect from a Buddhist Shaolin monk, kind of the way of the, the palm is better than the way of the fist. Mm-hmm. But then what we do get is this way of the fist creeping in. It looks like he is losing control of his anger. Yes, yeah. We talked about the, the theme of PTSD um, in season one. Mm-hmm. Uh, how kind of that fed into Danny's kind of character and stuff like that. And what we're seeing now is he's going through, he's now starting, to, he's dealt with the, say, the PTSD, but he's now dealing with additional memories, the additional things that happened in Kung Lung that we weren't privy to at that point. Mm-hmm. So now it's like, well, actually, we don't know the full rational or reason for the the anger that's coming out we're starting to see it yeah but we don't wait like, i.e we get a fantastic scene which uh in masks which we'll talk about later yeah but i'm really interested to see why there's this loss of control why is this anger bubbling in what we assume is again a buddhist like monk what did you guys think? I think this is slightly connected to the conversation he had with Luke Cage back in, in Luke Cage season two, where he's effectively telling Luke that he needs to manage his anger and keep control of it. And uh, and he's trying to show Luke ways to manage that. And what this scene and these scenes are really showing us with Danny is that he's also managing his anger. It's not that he's completely losing control all the time, I think. It's not that he's... Uh, that he's having a problem with managing it. I think he's just it's just showing that it's still under the surface all the time, but he is able to use his techniques to keep it in control when he needs to. And sometimes it goes a little bit beyond that. This scene was quite reminiscent, I thought, of the scene in Luke Cage uh, season two, where Luke rips off the top of a desk when he's being threatened with a court case by a lawyer. He rips the top of a desk off. It's kind of reminiscent to that, where they just get so frustrated yeah. and they're people of powers. So the powers just suddenly kind of spark out of them a little bit, you know? Yeah, I mean, you wonder whether as well the events that happened in The Defenders and and in particular maybe the burden to some extent that Matt Murdock has put on him to say defend my city and Mm -hmm. that, you know, if he is doing that, in a sense he's certainly doing it in Chinatown, whether he's doing it uh, in Hell's Kitchen, uh, we don't know. And maybe that's something yet to be to be seen um, in this series. I think they're probably going to keep it for Daredevil season three. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that element as well, he's angry at the death of Matt Murdock um, and certainly with the promise that he made to him. Maybe it's that pressure. Maybe as well, it's, it's still just getting through everything that happened to him in the Defenders because at the end of the day, um, it was his chi that they wanted. Uh, he was the focus of all the attention. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is really interesting that he he has more control over his iron fist in terms of powering it up, but he certainly is still having to deal with anger from, from some part there. I mean, I, I also, I think, I really like the fact that, you know, you see this build-up of this head of pressure, not only with Danny, but... But between these two gangs, you know, you see this tit for tat where the hatchet men are, are taking revenge uh, on the Golden Tigers for the armored vehicle job that Danny interrupted. Uh, really like that. And I like the fact, as you say, that uh, Danny ultimately does take this path to try and bring about a parlay, even though all I can think of is Pirates of the Caribbean. Yep. Um, <laughs> at, at, at the end of the day, it's an interesting thing and it almost kind of connects to colleen in that you know he wants to try and find another way as well i think and it's not just about deploying his iron fist and getting into fights and i like that i like also the fact that he's willing to go to mr yang i think there's a real similarity here with luke cage works with john McIver to to really try at the end of season two to sort of bring down black mariah Mm -hmm. um you know, there is that history between Danny and Mr. Yang from season one. They work together. Um, and I like this idea that, you know, where other street level heroes, other superheroes wouldn't necessarily go down uh, to the level of trying to work with what they would see as the enemies of the people. It, they're, you know, it would be traditionally their antagonists. I like this idea that he can approach Mr. Yang and that 
it's almost like a working relationship that they have. Yeah. I think the other thing from this as well, it may sound a bit obvious maybe, but I like that Danny Rand is more street. You know, he feels closer to the street. And it, it was it's really in this episode that I thought, okay, so episode one really wasn't just that one off where they were really focusing on Chinatown and then him, you know, taking sort of the manual job of being a, a mover. Uh, really shunning Rand Enterprises. You know, this really seems to continue for me, and I really like the fact that it is um, a permanent fixture here for this season of Iron Fist. Yeah, yeah, they definitely moved him from, as we said, the boardrooms to the street level this season, and it's a, a really yeah. nice choice. Can I interject here with a theory? Mm-hmm. But essentially what we do see is the challenge in this um, episode. We see the challenge between Davos and Danny. And at the end, Danny is constantly staying his hand. Mm-hmm. Like he's not going for that finishing blow because of a look as Davos rips off his uh, mask or like there's emotion behind. So Danny is taking, is being less violent. He's not taking the killing blow, the killing strike, Mm -hmm. like something that will end something like it will end a conflict or because he's staying his hand. Mm -hmm. So he's taking this more peaceful path. He doesn't want to hurt people. Okay. Yeah. That's what makes him a hero. Yeah, exactly. But what we're seeing is, as you guys said, the pressure building up in that he could easily bring about the end of this war by flaring up the iron fist and taking every single one of them down. Yeah. He, he, he could f- basically beat the hatchets into submission rather than parlay and talk and f- like be the upper man, the bigger man mm-hmm. potential. And, and then take into what Luke Cage says, which is like the anger is there. You just need to learn how to control it. Things like that. What I think we're seeing here is potentially going to be th- parts of the season will be Danny doubting the way of, Shao Lao, the way of Kung Wong, the way of the Iron Fist, in that if he flares up the power, he can get more done. Mm -hmm. He can be a better good guy by being a lethal protector, Mm -hmm. quote unquote, like the Venom storyline, by being slightly anti-hero and being a bad guy and punching first and talking after, he can get more done. Mm -hmm. But he's trying to be a man of two worlds. He's trying to be a man of peace while he's also a, a vigilante who does use violence to kind of sometimes bring about solutions. And that's where we get the punch, the, the, the flare up. Yeah. yeah. And I think we saw a little bit of that at the end of, uh, at the end of episode one, uh, as you said, that, that training moment where he's going out and training up the iron fist to possibly be able to use it more often than he was able to use it in season one and, and in defenders. So uh, yeah, I think that's a possibility we might see in the future. Yeah. I mean, I also think there's probably, Uh, a bit of conflict you know he has been trained and he has been brought up that the iron fist is a weapon Mm -hmm. to protect kun lun he is you know it the iron fist is a weapon and that is what he has been taught in kun lun Um, at the end of the day he is the protector of kun lun and would have to fight and it's that you know to get the iron fist there are these challenges these series of challenges uh, where you have to fight other people. But I think probably that he came from New York. Maybe, you know, those latent differences um, from coming from New York and going to a mystical city in the mountains, that there is some conflict there, absolutely. But I think he has conflict uh, within him, and that's like a massive character trait for him that he is yeah. battling against these different things. I certainly agree, but the big thing is that he's the protector of Kun Lun against the challenge of the Hand. Both Kun Lun and the Hand are gone now, so what does the Iron Fist do with his powers of the Iron Fist when he no longer has to protect Kun Lun or battle against the, the mystical Hand? So this is all stuff that Danny's now discovering as he's setting up his new life. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, you know, it, it's that conflict. And I think someone else who seems to be in conflict with herself mm-hmm. is Mary, who is very contrary. Uh, <laughs> as we move into point <laughs> number two. Mm-hmm. Yes, this this whole attack by the hatchets on the Golden Tigers effectively leads Danny to protect Mary in, in another chance encounter that they have 
Um, she's in a coffee shop. He's walking by. Um, you know, she's asking where she can take her photos uh, of people doing Tai Chi so that she can sort of get that dynamism in. And he really says, you know, stay off the streets today. He's been given a day off by his boss. Um, and he's really tr- wanting to try and source out, be protective of the city that he now lives and breathes. This is a really interesting encounter because, A, we get to see Mary again and all her absolute loveliness that is being put on screen. Um, But also he brings her back to the dojo. You know, he, he brings this, this lady that he barely knows into the dojo who meets Colleen and you see one of her turns, her episodes uh, while she's there in the dojo. Mm -hmm. And, And I just thought this was just really 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 good and i think how the character of mary walker typhoid mary uh moves through um this episode with that you know finally seeing this obsession that she seems to have it is really really good you know the fox is in the hen house here to an extent (laughs) um and i really can't wait to see um how this plays out certainly because you get the creepy you know phone call as well and that colleen picks up yeah that was that was proper nice little horror moment actually yes uh, yeah. really enjoyed Certainly. it so yeah mary being very contrary <laughs> yeah i really do enjoy this and and you know early on you think that she is this absolute innocent as danny comes across her in a uh, in a coffee shop while she's drawing and doing doing her artwork but has she set all this stuff up so she can get closer to danny it seems like it when we see the photographs at the end of it that she's been following him and trying to get into his life she's now made it inside the door of the dojo now knows where he lives and has the phone number of colleen and uh, danny's house and um, what i did like about this is the realism of colleen's discussion with danny i thought it was a really good interaction between the two of them as well where you know Mary's saying, oh, that's the second time he's been really nice. And Colleen really taking the piss out of Danny for being really nice to this very strange stranger <laughs> that he's now dragged inside <laughs> yeah, her home. Uh, it's really good moments from uh, from Jessica Henwick again. Uh, their, their relationship's working really well for me this season again. It's, it's, it's really good. And Alice Eve is just playing a fantastic version of this character, Mary. She p- comes across really innocent in some of the scenes. And when we see that switch in the apartment... We see that complete change of body language about her. This more confident version of Mary has suddenly appeared when she says thanks for everything and walks out the door of Colleen and Danny's dojo. Absolutely. And I think the really fantastic thing here, you get the most intense music here as she folds the post-it note, which has on it, stay away from Danny Rand. Um, I love these post-it notes. I think it's a real nice um, sort of aspect to her character and Mm -hmm. that she so intensely folds up these notes to to get rid of that other person who is speaking to her giving her instruction um but also yeah the music was properly intense as she did it yeah loved it i i I love alice eve i i loved her in star trek uh for the limited amount she was in with john harrison why thank you thank you you're welcome (laughs) anytime i name drop but Derek O'Neill, we'll try and find one at some point. Okay, There's some that. one of the showrunners will just put a random Derek O'Neill in there for you. He better be a podcaster. <laughs> um, I'm loving the portrayal of Typhoid Mary in this for all the reasons that you guys have discussed. So I'm not going to kind of continue to go over them. Um, I'm starting to wonder whether they're going for the split, i.e., two. Mm-hmm. Or they will go full three personalities, as in the comic books. Yeah, uh, which is th- uh, Mary, Typhoid Mary, Bloody Mary, mm-hmm. and essentially three distinct ones. I want to see where we get to, like, because I would love to see Bloody Mary being the the, the kick ass uh, action one. Typhoid is the conniving kind of one, and then the nice person is Mary, who's writing those lines, going, "No, please stay away from Danny. Don't do this." And that's the one I'm questioning. This is where I'm wondering, because we haven't gotten a huge amount here. We've only got a few scenes so far to go on. And I'm trying to work out who is the real personality. Who's the dominant personality here? We've seen Mary, and she's the innocent. But is Typhoid Mary the other more dark Mary? Is she the one that's saying stay away from Danny Rand because she's becoming obsessed with Danny as possibly being her savior? So is simple, nice, normal Mary, is she actually 
the other personality? Is she the alter ego who's actually been in control for a little while? Yeah, do you get what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. I don't know whether there, which one is yeah. the is the main Mary, the real Mary behind it all. I don't know whether you can save someone and get them back to innocent Mary if that wasn't their original state. I'm sure we'll see a lot more of Alice Eve. I love that they've committed to having her in both of the first episodes. We're definitely going to see a lot more of her throughout this season. I'm really looking forward to seeing more of the, the storyline. So moving on from one woman in Danny's life to the most important woman in Danny's life. Let's talk about Colleen in point number three and Colleen and the Rhino. Yes, yes. Uh, anybody wondering whether we were getting the Rhino from uh, from the Spider-Man universe when the kid calls himself a Rhino? <laughs> I was no. really surprised. I was going, is this a, a Marvel Easter egg in here that this kid's going to grow up to fight against Spider-Man in the other side of the city? Uh, that would be an I interesting had twist, no wouldn't it? Fear, unfortunately, as much as I would love it, no. <laughs> <laughs> why he's he's the leader of a gang he's going out robbing houses that's just what rhino would have done before he got the suit and and became mechanized and attacked him or armored and attacked spider-man so yeah that's that's but also rhino was a tiny short guy ugly stunted yeah it doesn't fit but i do see where you're going i did i did like this like when she's kind of has her lead on frank Choi, and there's no file in the visitor center we start getting these Oh, there's cover up here. And more and more I'm leaning towards this is, in my opinion, part of Davos's and Joy's um, conspiracy at this point. It's probably the best way of going. Master plan. Right. We, we don't know what. It, we're getting the hints here and there. And we'll talk more about it later in terms of the scenes that they were in. But more and more when the file goes missing. And apparently they make an effort to call out the person who does these files, keeps her pencil shavings. Yeah. Like, and is that fastidious that they, they keep everything? Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, so this is becoming the beginning of uh, the, the conspiracy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I really like how as well um, she reconnects with this this young gang from the restaurants as well that um, they are actually on the lookout for her you know they, they stage this mugging where she comes to, to rescue uh, the person who she thinks is being mugged only to be turned uh, against and brought back to their uh, their base mm. and we have this whole selection of, of um, young kids as you say trying to gradually build their own territory become a new triad gang within chinatown but ultimately colleen really again her uh, her ethos of trying to help the community co- comes back out and you know she's saying look it must be cold in here if you need to get some food some shelter some warmth you can always come down to the community center you know uh, and it, it's a, it's a really nice moment because you know they're not really having any of it but you can sense that there's a bit of pride is swallowed by by Rhino, the head of, of the gang. Mm-hmm. And she also builds up then this rapport or seemingly has some kind of connection with uh, one of the other gang members called BB, mm-hmm. uh, who kind of follows her out to kind of to say sorry, really, for having pointed the gun at her to yeah. um, to scare her. And uh, I just love the fact that she corrects his English as well. It's just like, <laughs> go, Colleen. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Really good. Yeah. So it, it was a nice little moment. And I, I'm really interested to see how this, this, this gang plays uh, within this storyline. Because one of the things you get the sense of from them is that Yes, they may not have a big territory, but they know an awful lot about what is going down in Chinatown. So will this be some kind of connected group uh, to at least Colleen specifically, but maybe even to Danny Rand, informing them about certain things that are going to be happening between the Golden Tigers, the Hatchets, or even maybe with... Uh, whatever Davos and and Joy are cooking up as well, yeah, yeah. so uh, it, it's a nice little uh, insertion, I think, into into this story, um, and I, I'm really interested to see how that plays out. Yeah, and we see that first piece of big information that BB gives her, which is about the the big attack that's going to happen on the Golden Tigers. Uh, this is what leads Colleen to connect those two dots, saying. Oh, big attack coming on the Tigers. We really need to get to Mr. Yang and the Hatchet Men and get this stopped before an all-out war breaks out in the streets of the city. You know, it's a good usage of these street kids. 
what I really like about them is that they are kids from the local community. And what they're really worried about is, well, we've got the Golden Tigers on one side, we've got the Hatchet Men on the other side. And they're carving up this territory, this town that is our local community. They're carving it up for themselves. They just want a piece of the city for themselves because, well, that's where they were born. That's where they were brought up. Um, it's a nice touch to have that bit of their backstory in there. But as I say, it does lead Colleen to tie it all together and go to ta- go to Danny t- to get him to come and speak to Mrs. Yang since he couldn't convince Mr. Yang to close off the um, war that was about to happen between the different factions. So the whole reason for it is because the community centre is being used by Mrs. Yang for a casino night, effectively. So once again... We see a little bit of corruption within the city of New York, this whole idea that um, Mrs. Yang can basically do whatever she wants to because she's a well-connected woman. She's connected to the leader of one of the major crime organizations. So they'll put on a casino night for her in the local community center and just turn a blind eye to the fact that you're not supposed to be doing that. And Colleen does convince Mrs. Yang, even though Danny wasn't able to do anything with Mr. Yang and he knew him for quite a while and had worked together with him in the past Colleen's very convincing with Mrs. Yang kind of saying you know you should have some form of influence over your husband you're a carer of this community you spend all of your time working with this community and improving it and if he goes into battle you're going to destroy everything you've built up so it does feel like that kind of guilt trip that would work on someone like Mariah for example in Harlem yeah it was a nice little exchange between Colleen uh, and Mrs. Yang here uh, Mrs. Yang being really dismissive of her to begin with, you know, I just want to enjoy my casino night here. I'm, you know, thankfully away from the husband kind of thing. And doesn't um, she even tell her to go to one of the lower tables when she sees yeah, her clothes? Absolutely. That's hilarious. <laughs> and that's, a, that's the moment for Colleen to just go, right, I'm getting a chair and I'm sitting right in your face until yeah, this is sorted. Exactly. <laughs> really, really good. Um, and I have to say, just a, a nice little exchange between these two women uh, in the community centre. But moving on to point four, you were speaking of blind eye and Davos gets blinded by the sun here Um, (laughs) in, yes, the challenge for the Iron Fist, Mm -hmm. the final challenge before Shaolau the Undying, Shaolau the Immortal. It is Davos and his brother from Kunlun, Danny Rand, Daniel Rankai, in fact, um, up for a bout of fighting in what is a fantastic setting, like absolutely really gorgeous. Um, Beautiful location. Yeah. It's kind of done in three movements over the episode in uh-huh. terms of this flashback, or I would say it's more of a memory because it kind of goes in soft focus onto Danny almost each time uh, we get transported to Kunlun. And I think it's just um fabulous setting seeing this um, pinnacle of their martial arts being played out between the two top fighters of their year or generation to become the next immortal Iron Fist uh, and, and the right to challenge uh, Shaolau the Dragon. Mm-hmm. So this was a, a fantastic look into Kun Lun here, much more so than what we got in season one and certainly a lot richer in terms of what we saw in terms of the setting, but just in terms of the colours. We get to see the Thunderer here as well. Um, and, of course, the iconic yellow masks as well. Yes. Um, just yeah. so, so good. And, of course, their gowns that they're wearing go from lovely bleach white to pretty red, to bleach. be honest. Yes. Like, it is pretty brutal, really violent fighting. Um, and, yeah, this was just a great moment in in this episode absolutely loved it can i ask our our iron fist aficionado uh has this been kind of brought up before that this trial is this in the immortal iron fist run is mm-hmm. it because i just i don't know is this comic book accurate that like danny would have yeah. had to kind of challenge yeah. someone else yeah you have to earn the right to face Xiao lao kun Lun is looking for its best uh fighter and so there are all these series of challenges and i mean ultimately that's a huge part of the iron fist uh law really is that he is involved in competitions or challenges even once he's become the iron fist as well whether Mm -hmm. it is the immortal weapons um 
all these different people trying to challenge the Iron Fist to beat him because ultimately in becoming Kun Lun's weapon, in becoming Kun Lun's protector, he puts that target on his back for other skilled fighters uh, to want to challenge him, to beat him. You know, he has that standard uh, attached to him. And so, yeah, I mean, it almost is a life of fighting, um, very much so. And I think that's why it works so well when the comics, like with this series, you know, go to mundane is not the right word but just that day-to-day life of danny rand with him battling you know seeing him and colleen in the dojo is fascinating in itself it because of the contrast that it provides to you know that grand setting in Kun Lun. Mm-hmm. um so it, it it's a really uh nice contrast of this character and, and what he was brought up to do and ultimately then what he struggles to want to do uh, when he's left Kun Lun. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think it's always as literal a fight between Danny and Davos for the right to battle against Shaila the Undying. If I if I understand, there are some stories where he wasn't the opponent or the yeah. opponent just wasn't known. Um, but certainly Davos has always felt that he was beaten to the fight by the unworthy Danny Rand is kind of what okay. we what we got in, in many of the comic book stories. But fellow defenders, if you want to know more about the comic book versions of Iron Fist, make sure you listen to our friends over on the Immortal Iron Fist podcast. They've covered tons and tons of comic books uh, all about Iron Fist. They're uh, well worth listening to as well. Yeah. Yes. I loved what Rachel, the director, did in, in this. As you said, it, the cinematography kind of made it slightly hazier. So yeah. it straight away we knew it was a memory, but... It was. I wouldn't go as far to say the lens flare was there, <laughs> uh, from like a J.J. Abrams style. Everything had its softer polish. Mm-hmm. F- like it's all, I hate to be again a millennial. It had a beautiful Instagram filter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've never looked that I, one down. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> no, I'm not, I know. I know. I'm, I'm sorry, fellow defenders. But I, I loved the three stages Mm -hmm. so the first was we got the rules yield or die and from that moment we see the iron fist mask now i knew it was coming in the trailers yeah but still it was fantastic to see it yeah definitely and the rope joining them at the beginning the silk scarf or some form of kind of cloth that they had to fight while swinging around each other while holding on it was brilliant yeah the haberdashery element to to the fight (laughs) which i loved by the way i have to say how they were tethered together was fantastic it's a cool choice isn't it and that kind of took us into the second movement that battle between the two of them and it's really well put together because the movements within the fight are kind of showing you that they're very evenly matched fighters we see that Danny's the one that does draw first blood. Uh, he uses the tether to wrap Davos's hands while he punches him. And then we see Davos twisting it on him, cutting the tether between the two of them and then knocking Danny to the ground. So very evenly matched throughout. You know, it's one of those ones where if this was a boxing match, you'd expect the next fight to be set up for six months later after this match because you can't tell all the way throughout the movements who's actually going to win the fight. We know because it's Danny and we know he has the, has the iron fist, but you can kind of see why Davos may feel that he was just as justified winning that battle. 100%. And you do also hear that this isn't the first battle they've had to get to this moment. There's many, many battles that led both of these fighters to get to this moment in the ring against each other. It's not just because they grew up together or because they're the most likely opponents. It's because they fought their entire life throughout many, many stages to get to this moment. So really nice touches here. Really interesting moment as well in that battle. Um, I might be wrong, but for me... Uh, Just after Davos has kind of cut that tether or ripped that tether between them, um, he really goes close to Danny, And it looks to me, or this is how I took it anyway, that he tries to do that same move that he does on uh, Mr. Yang in his office on the docks. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you you get that moment where you see, I think it's either the Thunderer um, or it's um, the other guy in in that chamber where they they look at um, the the, the woman that sat there kind of going, why is he doing that technique? That, Mm -hmm. that, you know, this is a particular technique that is is trained and is taught and that maybe it's something that shouldn't be used in this kind of ceremonial fight. And I thought that was really interesting because, I mean, it does get so, so bloody. I mean, it does feel 
personal, even though what we hear from Davos and, and Danny from season one, as well as the start of uh, season two in the, in the last episode is, you know, they were brothers that they, they hung out. They, they had a mutual respect mm-hmm. and it seems as though at this moment in time in this fight, it suddenly gets dirty because that prize of facing Shao Lao to become the immortal Iron fist, assuming you win, is there and certainly you see the hunger in davos uh to to want to get there absolutely yeah this five finger death punch or fist of the north star movement i saw that too and it's uh-huh. only at the end you're like oh did he oh yeah, yeah yeah and i think you're right i think it's like no this is supposed to be a a clean battle and what they're seeing is that davos is willing to break the rules where Danny stays in the rules. Yeah. And that kind of leads us into the kind of set three, uh, which is where we start to see like the two of them are going, what seems like hours fight on fight. So Danny, uh, while getting beaten badly, sees the sun and goes, okay, I know how to get the upper hand. Mm -hmm. And essentially blinds Davos by the light and it gets him with multiple multiple kind of takedowns and but then Danny hesitates once he's Davos is on the ground again kind of bring me back to my earlier point yeah. like you can see him he's like yield he could easily go and knock Davos out but he's he's holding well there is the big thing it's not knocking Davos out. It's he has to kill Davos. He has to kill his brother or he yields. That the only two options in here. Yeah. And what we saw earlier on was Davos did beat Danny when he was on the ground to get him to yield as well. Luckily, Danny got out of that situation and strike back and, and did stand resolute in his abilities at that moment. But Danny, you're right. He does hesitate because he doesn't want to kill his brother for this opportunity. He feels his brother should be happy for him, I guess. He feels yeah. that he's won the fight, fight fair and square. Yes, he used the environment, but hey, that's just it's just the sun, you know, still be able to counter that. You know, it's not like he he cut his he cut his neck or something like that. He's genuinely going. We stated in the bends of the fight. I'm the winner, you know, um, but Davos isn't willing to to give up on that. So there's an announcement from the panel that gets Davos out of the fight and makes him give up and yield. So I can understand why, again, Davos does feel that this whole opportunity was taken away from the thing that he's worked for his entire life he didn't yield and he didn't die so yeah exactly you know it's it's one of those one of those things like the black panther fight uh, that we saw in in black panther between him and killmonger where he didn't die and he didn't give over his reign to new killmonger therefore he can stand back as black panther so you know we have a similar situation here with davos and Danny. yeah and i think what we're going to end up getting i'm calling it is a reenactment of this fight they may not be able to do it in the exact location, mm-hmm. but they'll do it in a circular kind of area where they get to do this. And it will come back down to yield or die. Mm-hmm. And the question then I have is, will Danny take Davos's life? Even after Davos is probably going to be done a load of atrocious stuff <laughs> in this season, it will come down to that. Mm-hmm. And there will be no Thunderer to take the decision or take it out or call it early. And that's where I'm dying to see how this progresses. Actually, beyond that, I'm dying to see what the impact of this is in other flashbacks. We know that Davos feels slighted by this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But how, how does it happen? I know we're not going to get the fight of Shao but we're going to get him to seeing him walk up. We're going to see him come out with the Iron Fist. We're going to see the bestowing of the actual... Iron Fist robes and masks. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Maybe. I'm kind of guessing. But <laughs> yeah. I, it's actually, I, I love this because it all comes down to more Kung Lo, more of the past and what happened in Kung Lo. And just to say, you know, this is something that we wished for the whole of season one. And I'm sure it was expensive to film. Don't get me wrong. But look how easy it was to give us what we wanted in season one. <laughs> all they did was find an absolutely amazing location, most likely in the New York area. Brought the cast and crew there. Both Sasha Dewan and Finn Jones have mentioned that they're the ones doing this fight. They trained for weeks. They filmed for days to get this fight right in all of its different movements with the new fight coordinator that we have on, on season two of the show. Um, have a great director in there. And all you have is a scene 
which while filmed in New York does feel mystical, does feel like it's filmed in this city of Kunlun that we haven't been to. You know, the whole mysticism, the whole ritualistic aspect of what's happening here comes through in these scenes that we didn't get, unfortunately, within season one. We just had Finn Jones talking about them as the character of Danny Rand. And it's not that difficult to do. (laughs) Okay, I don't make films, but it doesn't feel like this is the most difficult thing in the world to do. They really pulled off a great job here to make it feel like something brand new for season two. And while I don't need to see more Kunlun episodes throughout the season after seeing this, because this is the big one, I hope we do get to return to the city at some point and see some other moments of the young lives of Danny and Davos. Yeah, it'd be really good that. I mean, and certainly I, it'd be really nice to see this mirrored in present day between Danny Rand and Davos, as Chris mentioned. Mm -hmm. And just coming to Chris and saying, well, maybe we get the Man of Steel moment where he doesn't want to snap his neck and he's trying to hold off and not snap Mm -hmm. uh, Davos's neck, but in the end um, is forced to do it for the greater good or something. The greater good. The greater good, exactly. Um, and of course, we've been speaking about the the judges in the fight, and now we have a, an auction as we move on to point five. Can you auction joy? Is the question. <laughs> I loved Meacham in this. Yeah, both Meachams were both. great. I, that's that's why I didn't decide over joy or award. I just I love Meacham because ah, oh, this is brilliant. <laughs> Hello, Davos. It is It is great to have these two together. You know, you can tell they've grown up together. You can tell they've worked side by side with each other. Uh, these two characters together are great. But we have the fact that Joy is attending this auction with a former classmate, a former schoolmate or college mate who, as Ward points out, she absolutely hated when she went to college. Uh, but Joy is using her to get this item for Davos. She's really almost in a way becoming a bit of a minion for Davos is what we're seeing. She's working with him and kind of bankrolling everything that he's doing based on the things that he needs and the things that he wants. Um, The piece that she's looking at, we see it a little bit later on, looks a bit like a ritualistic bowl, possibly to do with a ceremony um, or the ceremony that gave potentially Danny his iron fist, maybe something like that. Is this something that he needs to do a very big ritual that he may be doing in the future. Yeah, um, it looks like it probably is going to contain blood at some point, mm-hmm. you know? One of those sort kind of, of ritualistic, old. ceremonial, um, needs to be in its original state. You know, Davos doesn't want it to be cleaned up, spruced yeah. up, buffed up, or anything like that. Like, did it contain the heart of Sher Lao at some point? Can can he resurrect the heart of Sher Lao by having this bowl? Is it that specific will we will we even get into those specifics in the later episode but i do love that moment when he's being told this is going up for auction in a couple of months time and he's like nope i want it tonight <laughs> yeah to take it right now i have to say as well the um you know the, the friend or the person from school that that joy doesn't like at all mika prada um i do like the fact that she calls Davos David. um <laughs> it was just a great moment because i mean Davos is fantastic just in his pure pompousness. Mm-hmm. Like he is absolutely so straight laced. Um, and I love as well the fact that Joy uh, effectively makes Davos get down and dirty uh, by using uh, more, say, American tactics uh, than the, the the simple fighting tactics that he would do from Kunlun, maybe the, the purer black and white tactics of Kunlun, um, because you really get the sense that he uh, is going to um, do something pretty dreadful to to Mika uh, with, with the knife that's left on the side. And then it would seem that Mika has probably done something pretty dreadful to Davos, uh, given that when he turns up and rocks up at Mr. Yang's office, um, I do think he comes out with one of the best deadpan lines ever, which is, you don't know what I've been through. Um, <laughs> don't, don't try me. Um, because certainly uh, whatever was happening was certainly a bit of rough, styly slap and tickle, I would say. <laughs> a bit of slap, tickle and strangle, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Slap, tickle, strangle. Yeah. I very much thought we were getting Fifty Shades of Green here. <laughs> uh, or sorry, Fifty Shades of Yellow and Green. Yeah, it got interesting. Um, I did 
like that they had to pan back just to show you that there was a camera on them. I was waiting for Joy to walk back in. Mm-hmm. I wasn't expecting video bribery, but sure, that works too. I'm liking the lengths they'll go to, though. This is the the degradation of Davos. So he's constantly talking about how degraded uh, and how terrible the Western world is. Oh, yeah. And it's not Kung Lung. But here we're starting to see him do the evil in his mind the evil things the degraded the despicable things to get what he wants to get mm-hmm. back to Kung Lung to get back at Danny we're seeing the birth of the steel serpent to a degree um, we're seeing the birth of the arch villain the arch rival of Danny Rand yeah and I'm oh, loving yeah. that totally agree and you get that moment of him being the monk of Kung Lung feeling everything around him is just absolutely distasteful what he's doing you know he would prefer to just snap this woman's neck and take the bowl rather than have to have sex with her and (laughs) and bribe her to get the bowl that just seems totally wrong to davos it feels like he could absolutely kill her in that second and that's fine he'll get what he wants but at least he doesn't break his oath and break his vows that he had in kunlun you know that's what it feels like it seems like it took a lot for him to center his chi uh, in that moment so you Mm -hmm. know he certainly has control he certainly has control i really as well i have to uh, say yeah ward was fabulous as um has been mentioned i love the line when he goes to, up to Joy and he says, have you come to bid on this Tibetan Tonka of his dreams? I think <laughs> as Davos turns up, it's just, it's so uh, dismissive of Davos. And again, you just think the genius of, of Ward in that moment with Davos is that he has no idea how dangerous Davos is. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Or he doesn't see him as a threat. Uh, he might know he, that he knows a bit of karate and martial arts and that he probably, if he went too far, could take him out. But he doesn't think that he would necessarily do it in a public auction house. So that's why he's willing to risk it. And yet you'd kind of feel Davos will. He would just take everyone out in public if he felt he had to in order to achieve his goal so it's just that fine line of danger that is there between davos and ward yet you get an absolutely stonking comment from ward i uh, mm-hmm. really really enjoy it yeah and i like that moment as davos walks up as well and he just goes i get it i give it a week <laughs> <laughs> and that's it just thinking it's just a normal relationship but yeah just to finish off that point that you were making earlier on about you mr yang um mr yang once again changed the terms as far as davos is concerned because he's called off the gang war within the streets of chinatown this means that he can no longer carry the package for Davos that Davos has been waiting on. So um, after the night he's had, as you said, uh, he can't take this one last humiliation and puts an end to Mr. Yang uh, using that little technique from Kun Lun. So um, unfortunately, Mr. Yang, he's appeared in six, seven episodes right now. That looks like the end of him. Yeah, it looks yep. like he's a goner, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but much like uh, Ward's schedule is ship balls crazy, as the secretary says, I like that one. It looks like Davos's calendar now is going to be crazy. He needs to find a new import export business, potentially going to the Tigers, where he needs his package in. So he's just got one package delivered in the form of the bowl and his nightly escapades. Now he's just waiting on his other one. Mm-hmm. But gentlemen. Uh, I think that wraps up all of our special points for this episode. So let's move into extra time and talk about our notes. Has anyone got any notes? I do. Just one. Um, It's a continuation of Danny Rand sort of re-engaging and catching up on everything. Uh, There's that moment where they're talking about uh, Jack Nicholson in Chinatown and how they're making their way through the the 70s movies at this moment in time um, to get him up to speed with effectively pop culture uh, and and modern life. So, uh, yeah, 
Jack Nicholson and Chinatown. Probably then moving on to Alien, and then for the 80s we'll get Aliens or something. <laughs> I think there's a little riff they, on that, because the characters of Colin Wing and uh, Danny Rand became very popular in the 70s. They're, they're tended to be talked about in terms of, of kung fu movies coming to America during the 70s. So I like that moment when Colin's saying that to her friend about them going through the 70s movies, and he goes, oh, that must be really tough. And she goes, mm, not too bad. <laughs> you know, so there's some really good examples of great movies throughout the 70s. Uh, and I think Colleen might be hitting on quite a good, quite a couple of good ones there. I do hope we get the uh, the big trouble in Little Chinatown <laughs> reference with Kurt Russell. Oh come on, that would be hilarious. That'd just, be great. Just the guy in the the the, the hat that spins, and hey, I, I want to hear the Pocock references from those ones. <laughs> I have a feeling they're probably striking a more serious tone uh, in this season. So we're maybe get so more references to other great kung fu films from uh, from the seventies and eighties. Maybe so. But moving on to the business end of our podcast, Chris, do you defend this episode of Iron Fist? I'm going to keep this short and sweet and just say, yes, I do defend. (laughs) I am very happy with the pacing, with the production, with the the story that we are getting two episodes in. This is a strong start. Two hours in. I want to know where where everything's going. I'm getting additional character depth. I'm getting more storyline hints. I'm getting fantastic fight scenes, fantastic Mm -hmm. fight scenes, really well choreographed. The cinematography I already talked about is amazing. So yes, I defend this and I just want them to keep it up. And I think that they will. Derek, do you defend this episode of the Iron Fist? I absolutely defend this episode of Iron Fist. This is the, uh, this is a really, really good episode and really bodes well for this series of the show. Uh, I'm really excited and intrigued by everything that's going on. I love Joy and Davos together. I love their interaction. I love what's going on with Danny and Colleen and all of the things that are going on in this new streetscape for the character of Iron Fist. As you mentioned, John, the fact that this is now a much more street level hero for this season is just making it so much more interesting to watch. And we still get the other characters that we enjoyed in season one. What's not to like, huh? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And last up, John, do you defend this episode of Iron Fist? I do defend this episode of Iron Fist. I give it four Tibetan Tonkas out of five. <laughs> uh, yeah, really like this uh, again. Um, it is just really amazing to see such a fantastic sequence of fights mm-hmm. uh, between Davos and Danny uh, in Kunlun. Uh, that was just magical for me, seeing that. Really, really good. And having Mary back on doing her origami as she folds the post-it notes. Amazing. I want to see more of her on uh, the the episodes. You know, they're still kind of building her character and introducing yeah. her, but I really want to see what she I- I- is about and how she is going to link in with Davos and Danny. Um, and, yeah, I mean, even having Mr. and Mrs. Yang, fantastic. Um, I loved Mrs. Yang's interaction with Colleen. Um, and again, having Mr. Yang the, you know, face to face with Danny, face to face with, um, Davos. Uh, so I'm hoping that, you know, that sort of three fingered punch to the neck that Davos did didn't necessarily kill him uh, but who knows it looks not very good for mr yang Mm -hmm. but absolutely loving this the fight sequences uh, just the whole feel and vibe of this season is so far for me has been really really good so yes i do defend this episode perfect that's it that's the end of our discussion of the city's not for burning episode two of iron fist as we mentioned no feedback until uh, after the weekend uh, when all of our fellow defenders have had a chance to watch these episodes and catch up uh, but if you do want to send us your feedback you can email us at feedback at defenders tv podcast.com just knock on the name of the episode that you're talking about or the episode number if you can't remember the name uh, so that we don't get spoiled about future episodes of the podcast uh, we We'll have another episode out really soon over this weekend uh, for episode three of Iron Fist, which is the deadly secret. Yes. And remember, please head on over and subscribe to Defenders TV podcast over on Apple podcast or Google podcast. Um, please uh, share the love by sharing the podcast. So remember, for anything to do with Marvel Netflix shows, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Daredevil, The Punisher please head on over to DefendersTVPodcast.com. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Defenders, and I will leave you with this deadly secret. 
I like you guys. Not in that way. It's kind of mutual, kind of platonic, but we'll see you next episode. Thanks so much for joining us, fellow defenders. Talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you so much, fellow defenders, for tuning in. As always, it has been a pleasure. I'm off to go and fold some post-it notes. And when I'm back after folding my post-it notes really, really carefully, I will speak with you again soon. Bye.